my um, my introduction was just to the point that um, having worked with Metrosense and having worked in the MRI safety domain specifically for the last three and a half years, um, I've had the honor and privilege of probably visiting over 20 countries where I've seen um, hugely, vastly different processes and procedures and uh, some causes for concern in terms of how MRI safety is adopted in uh, various different practices. So I think I want to bring a little bit to you to that information, but not make it too, you know, pedantic and too, too sort of technical, but just giving you some real home truths about what is going on in the world of MRI safety and uh, how we can, you know, as an organization, as a team, as a, as a sort of, um, you know, uh, educationary body, learn from these practices and learn from, shall we say, some of the challenges that um, the MRI safety world faces today. And they're very real challenges. You know, I, I don't want to teach you theory. I want to actually tell you why these things are a cause for concern in, in real life. Um, so we're going to we're going to go into a little bit about MRI safety. I'm going to be joined um, in the second half of this uh, presentation by uh, my colleague Shweta, Shweta Dang, who's actually probably in the building there today. She's uh, representing me in person. Thanks, Shweta. So I'm going to talk for the first bit. It's going to be about what are the types of MR safety hazards and concern. And later on, we'll, we'll cover what you guys can do as an organization, as a wonderful Tata Mumura group to, to help reduce those accidents and how you can make life a bit easier for you and your, and your staff and your patients. Um, I would presume that you guys are very aware of 1.5 Tesla magnets and three Tesla magnets, and you're probably working with both, right? If I'm, if I'm mistaken, let me know, but that's kind of the reality of the world we live in today. 1.5T, 3T, even seven Tesla magnets are becoming a thing of a reality. So why that's a slight bit of a concern is because a three Tesla magnet actually is around 60 times stronger in terms of the Earth's magnetic field. For every one Tesla, you're looking at about 10,000 Gauss. So the higher your Tesla strength of the magnet, obviously the higher pulling the force it has in terms of the magnetic field it creates. In the world we live in today, MRI scans are not going away, right? They're going to become more and more and more frequent. Um, our need and our desire to diagnose um, diseases earlier on to get a better feel for how the patients are progressing in terms of their treatment, we do more scans. More scans, statistically, high the probability of risk, of course. Um, there is still a slight bit of a concern in terms of the awareness that uh, and the new members of uh, students and staff that are being trained in terms of uh, MRIs, they're still not completely aware of what are the do's and don'ts, you know, they're still learning in terms of what's going on. Um, the potential for accidents and fatalities is greater in terms of an MRI scan than in any other form of modality because when you're talking about ionization radiation, such as CTs, those type of, uh, those type of equipment don't have an immediate, you know, fatality as associated with it. Because it's, you know, you're talking about dose, you're talking about the, the exposure over a period of time, correct? With an MRI, there is no such thing. You know, you have one chance, you get in there, you make a mistake, potentially you can really injure that patient or your staff member, um, or you can kill that patient, of course. So it's an immediate, you know, something you've got to bear in mind. And of course, let's not, uh, let's not kid ourselves. Nobody really wants to uh, damage uh, a million dollar piece of kit like an MRI machine. So we have to also think of the cost and the downtime associated with, uh, uh, you know, having a bad accident occur in an MRI uh, room. So we have um, these three main fields that you see up here as, a, uh, as something we have to keep in mind in terms of MRI safety, and then we've got some other issues, but uh, static magnetic field, which is associated with the, with the magnet itself, and that's always on. So you've got a constant risk associated with static magnetic field. Gradient fields and RF fields are really when the magnets are on. You guys will probably know this. So gradient fields is the ambient noise. So how do you make sure that the patient is obviously 
completely um, cared for in terms of the auditory damage that the gradient field can cause with the noise. If you've ever been in an MR scan, like I'm sure most of us have, you'll know how painful that process is for your poor eardrums. And then the RF field is associated with the, with the heating, heating as in giving you burns. So we'll talk a little bit about those uh, three main areas. And then the other issues, we'll just cover some of the other smaller, but very, um, well, not smaller, but sort of more infrequent, but still a very cause for concern in terms of uh, critically ill patients, pediatrics, and of, of course, claustrophobia. Um, so let's start with the static magnetic effect in terms of the static field. So we've got two different variables here that we've got to consider. For me, I would always say that you've got a big issue with bigger issue with things like projectiles, implants, and wearable threats, for sure, without doubt, because it's so imminent, it's so it's so sort of impactful. So keep the mechanical side of it always close to your mind. Uh, and that's very visual as well. And of course, you've got the biological side of it. And we're going to talk about that in terms of uh, the, the implant side of it. So what, what do I mean by projectiles? If you are in a magnet area, like in an MRI room, and if you have any such, uh, shall we say, non-safe equipment nearby, this is what a projectile effect can look like. Why is that? Because in that space, a ferrous object, i.e., you know, something that has uh, iron derivative, can fly at uh, 64 kilometers an hour into a uh, into a magnet and can cause some serious injury and serious harm, but also obviously damage your equipment. Um, bearing in mind very, very, very carefully, if you understand, there is a difference between what a 1.5 Tesla can do versus a three Tesla magnet. So you'll have a slightly different layout in the room, might have a different sort of Gauss sign parameter. So they can have different um, effects on the non MR safe equipment nearby. Um, so as I just mentioned, you've got those very, um, very sort of normal looking pieces of kit. You're going to come across oxygen cylinders. You're going to see wheelchairs could or could not be MR safe, depending on, you know, if somebody's bringing it in from a anesthesia ward or from the emergency ward, wheeling people in, in uh, wheelchairs that are clearly not designed to sit in an MR zone. You have to stop and check are the trolleys safe for transport? Where's the IV stand come from? Does it have the appropriate labeling? Uh, you've got lots of different monitoring equipments now, you know, top of the range monitoring equipments, uh, patient monitors, you've got ventilators, you've got all kinds of different injectors out there. So as we get more and more equipped with the top notch equipment around that the world is giving us, we want to give the best care to our patients. And in order to do that, we have to be very vigilant of what is coming into an MR environment. This is also one of the reasons later on, I'm sure you're going to have covered in your slides by uh, Dr. Tobias Skilk, who's a very good friend and a consultant that I work with. He'll talk about how you zone your different equipment. You know, where do you store these kind of safe versus unsafe equipment? Is it, should it be in zone two? Should it be in zone one? You know, the way you reduce your risk is by making sure you are properly labeling and storing your equipment in the right places so that they don't end up as a ferromagnetic risk in zone four where your magnet is stored. These things kill people without doubt. I have been in many facilities where this has happened <laughs> and I've heard of many such incidences on, on the news, of course. The smaller items, but more frequent items I have also come across in many different facilities are things like coins, uh, jewelry, scissors, big problem. And I'll, I'll talk about that for a second. Mobile phones, we're a little bit more understanding of mobile phones should not be in those areas because we love our mobile phones and we don't want them to get spoiled. And you know what a magnetic field can do and keys. But let me tell you, scissors or hemostatic scissors are frequently used in a hospital environment. I have physically been to a hospital very recently, both in Italy and Germany, where we had, uh, where we, where they were asking us for some help. They're like, we've had an incident where a pair of scissors was left 
very casually, of course, total accident in a nurse's um, breast pocket, you know, and she just kind of walked in accidentally, not realizing she'd left the scissors there. The patient was being prepped, was um, literally placed into the bore of the magnet. The scissor flew out of her breast pocket and pierced his orbital lobe, requiring, you know, permanent damage and surgery to fix that permanent damage. It's a very small mistake that could have been avoided. You just forget what you think is a everyday piece of equipment that you use in your facility could cause some serious damage. So just keep these little items in mind. What are you doing and are they, are they rightfully deserving to go into that space or not? Um, then we've got the implant side of it. You know, boy, oh boy, oh boy, everybody loves talking about implants these days because there's so many of them. So many of them that are being approved by the FDA, being implanted in various different hospitals around the world, clinical trials taking place. They're trying to improve patient life. Implant and the side of the, so we say the effects that a uh, magnet can cause an implant can be catastrophic. You know, mainly you're talking about the transitional force and the torque um, that the implant can, uh, can succumb to. Implants can be ripped, moved. There are cases where aneurysm clip has actually caused hemorrhage in a brain because it's moved. And uh, there are cases where pacemakers have malfunctioned because they've not been aware or they've not put it into, shall we say, safe mode. Because as you know, nowadays you've got MR conditional pacemakers that are being treated, uh, patients being treated with. You've got cochal hearing implants that are becoming a thing of the norm nowadays, and that can cause serious hearing damage. So there's a lot of issues associated with knowing can the implant be scanned? What could once upon a time be scanned at 1.5 Tesla, you need to go back and check with the uh, implant manufacturer and on the instructions for use labeling and the FDA labeling, can this implant be scanned at a three Tesla? And if so, what is the, you know, what is the type of scanning that I can do? What's the level of exposure that it can have, the time, the scanning time, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some real serious, um, you know, watch out implants. Probably going to become a very, very normal thing in India too, like it is in the UK and in the US. More implant surgeries taking place for lots of different, different needs as we have an aging population or population with different ailments to think about. So um, that's probably one. And if you want a specific talk about implants, we can probably do a separate one for you because it's going to require very in-depth understanding about what are the causes and concerns you've got to think about when you're scanning implants. What I will tell you, and there's a little disclaimer out there because I cannot go into details about it, is you know, you have to think about the patient's risk versus benefit. So just turning a patient away because they have an implant is not the appropriate solution or the answer. You've got to perform the appropriate risk versus benefit. And then you decide as a, as a hospital or as a team, how can I scan this patient safely so that I don't cause them any injury or any long lasting damage, of course, as opposed to just saying, oh, they have a pacemaker, we don't do that, so bye-bye. That's also not the appropriate approach because one, you could potentially risk that person's life by not knowing what conditions you would have caught if you had put them through an MRI scan. So I just want to put that out there. That please don't just turn a patient away if they do have a number of these different implants out there. If you're not sure why an implant is a problem, and that's, I'll tell you very simply, implants are made of ferrous material. All these implants you see up here are made of ferrous material, except something that is not made of ferrous material. In that case, don't worry about it. Take, for example, breast implants, silicon material, you don't have to worry about it. Everything on here that you see, ferrous material in there somehow, that's why you have to think about what that implant can do uh, or what that magnet can do to that implant uh, under scanning conditions. Um, there are some orthopedic implants, even though I have it listed up here, that are not made of ferrous material, right? So again, you don't have to worry about them so much if they're made 100% titanium. But a lot of orthopedic implants, if they have orthopedic surgery that they've conducted recently on that patient, 
might have some ferrous screws that go with it. In that case, you have to keep it in mind, you know, how dangerous could that be? Because if it's a very new surgery, it can move. So there's lots of different types of biomedical implants to keep in mind. Um, by far, after all the different studies that have been conducted, it's the pacemaker, the pacemaker that you have to kind of keep more in mind because th those are the ones you're gonna come across more frequently than any other type of implants out there. Of course, you've got uh, more and more stents that are also being implanted with uh, all the different cardiac problems. But I would say generally in terms of the list of different implants out there to be concerned about, it's usually the pacemaker and the pacemaker leads. So, um, okay. So why pacemakers? We want to talk a little bit about that cause, you know, it has some serious effects when it comes to uh, scanning with the MR. You've got induced currents, you've got excessive heating, all part and parcel of also RF field. Um, the actual implant can be modified. So you can actually end up electrocuting the patient, believe it or not, obviously, under the uh, MR uh, scanning conditions. Uh, you can start triggering the devices where it shouldn't be triggered because, you know, the pacemakers are essentially on a certain pace and by having it under these uh, extreme conditions, you can trigger in inappropriate um, sensing of the device. And of course, as I mentioned before, torque. Torque will basically displace that implant if it's uh, under, uh, under the wrong condition. So it'll move switch up a little bit and that's also not what you want essentially you're ripping it out of its uh, implanted location that's how powerful that magnet is for a small pacemaker at the wrong conditions let me put that out there the wrong conditions wrong settings um, another one that's really really cool nowadays really interesting because I've come across this a lot more in the, on the US side and the UK side probably less less so in India but growing trend nevertheless is you've got other wearable threats uh something that's that's you know becoming more fashionable these days you've got dermal piercings they're made of different kinds of uh, steel they're not necessarily made of just silver and gold so we don't have to worry about silver and gold and titanium and brass because uh, they're not attracted by the magnet but what is, is obviously every other metal. So if you've got those type of things that patients might be hiding or not disclosing under the patient screening um, forms, then keep in mind it can cause a little bit of damage. It can cause some, <laughs> some discomfort to, to those patients. Um, another, another really interesting trend, if you look at this image over here, there's a, there's a bit of a burn going on on this patient's thigh uh, is that a lot of people across in the western world are wearing um, uh, clothing that's made of uh, silver fibers and that's because it's it's kind of prevents odor it's got a natural antibacterial property to it and that silver fiber garment is a brilliant heat conducting material so if that's worn in an mri in my MRI screen, MRI scan, you're going to end up potentially with some serious, um, uh, you know, cutaneous burns. So again, we ask the patients where possible. We try to, you know, try to promote changing them into the hospital gowns as much as possible. Please don't wear your outside clothing just in case. We've got, we've got different types of um, little sticky devices that you see out here. Some of them have magnetic patches that we are not always aware of. Some. In some Western countries, they're used for delivering small doses of medication. We've got, you know, sort of diabetic diabetes monitors. You've got some mosquito bite patches. There's so many things that are out there. So all part and parcel of kind of doing your appropriate MR screening so that you can prevent these types of burns or uh, potential, you know, um, skin damage injuries to occur. Magnetic lashes. I don't know if you've seen them in India, but it's a big thing out here in the West. Um, I've seen eyelids scored, completely scored, because they've gone in and they've not declared that they've got fake lashes, magnetic lashes during the scanning, um, MR scanning procedure. So just some things to watch out for. I'm not sure how often you're gonna come across them, but once is bad enough to probably create some, shall we say, bad blood and some, and some unwanted attention for a facility like yours. 
So we'll talk a little bit about Graden Field, not too much, because I think we have a little bit more about it covered later on in the sessions about how you can prevent uh, damage from the gradient field. And then we'll talk about RF heating. So, um, so I've got some of these stats or some of these recommendations really from the, from the US Occupational Safety and Health. But I must say like when you are looking at what uh, the US is doing in terms of the American College of Radiology guidelines, the Veterans Association uh, and something like the Health and Safety Administration, we have some pretty clear uh, clinical data in terms of why this makes sense. So I'd refer to it, you know, if there is something maybe different from the Indian regulation standpoint, then please correct me maybe uh, at the end of this presentation or just send me an email about it. I'd love to know if you guys might have different permissible uh, limits. Uh, but this is what we have as a guideline in terms of what, uh, in terms of number of hours and exposure of, uh, of noise. A typical MR scan, as we say, usually lasts one hour, sometimes less. Yes, I've been in, in several different instances where maybe it's only 30 minutes is doable, but if you're having musculoskeletal problems, usually lasts about one hour. Um, and it can, your, your, the noise exposure level can get up to 105 decibels. So we do say you've got to do something to prevent that kind of exposure to your patient. Uh, otherwise you end up with a horrible ringing noise and potentially some hearing loss temporary, not permanent, but temporary, but you don't really want that kind of damage anyway. Um, so we do say there are like, if there's something you can do, then it's a very simple remedy. There are different ways you can do that, you know, in terms of cinema, cinema vision and cinema sort of uh, auditory uh, over, over the year protectors. And of course, make the patient as comfortable as possible and make sure that they're, they're communicating with you uh, on the other side of the barrier to say, look, I'm not comfortable, the noise is too high, please do something about it. Um, and of course, you've also got to worry about your, your staff, yeah, because your staff are also constantly exposed to that, to those uh, noise levels. So it's a, it's a real problem. It doesn't get talked about and reported enough, but it's a very real problem that's happening in the world of MR safety. Uh, so instead of always focusing on just projectiles and implants, we forget that this is also something that creeps up every now and then. Um, and you have, you know, a population that is really uncomfortable with going into MR scanning rooms because of the noise that they're exposed to for the length of the time. And finally, we're going to talk um, in terms of the third field, the RF field, and why that's important to us uh, to prevent things like burns. Out of all the different uh, fields I've just talked about, the RF field is probably the one you've got to pay most attention to. And I'll tell you why, because the number of MR accidents that are occurring in the world, the, the most, uh, the highest category is actually burns. And a lot of them go unreported. Majority of them, like 90% of them go unreported. So patient burns, uh, skin burns, essentially burn is a burn. You've got first degree, second degree, and third degree burns. If you guys know the different degrees of burn, it's basically first degree being quite superficial. Then you've got second degree, which is a layer below, and the third degree, which is se severe, severe case of a burn, almost like, you know, almost the point you've left scarred tissue. But first and second degree is where things are most common here in the world of MR with the RF field, because RF is essentially what's just, you know, creating heat heat is what's developing around the skin and particularly for one reason and that's a loop that's been formed. Um, longer devices such as cables uh, or even longer implants uh, like pacemaker leads or stents and things like that are more prone to uh, causing burns. They just, they just like longer loops. Uh, wherever you have a loop now, I don't know if you can see me clearly, but this is a loop, right? This is a loop. So if your skin to skin contact is occurring during an MR scan, this is an absolute beautiful reason for a burn to occur. But where does the burn occur? Where there's skin to skin contact. So if your thumb might be touching the outer part of your thigh and you haven't kind of made sure there's proper padding in between, you are gonna end up with a burn on that poor patient. Now, here's the interesting part. 
the patient doesn't always know that they actually have a burn creating during the MR scan. They usually go home and they come back or they might not even come back and tell you that, you know, I've suddenly got a really bad blister on the outside of my thigh or on my finger. They can't kind of put two and two together that that was caused during an MR scan. So we don't often know that we're causing these burns to these patients. Um, the burns can start developing after a couple of hours. So just keep that in mind, please, that, you know, you have to appropriately pad them, especially with ECG cables. Um, <clears throat> any kind of cables that the patient might be catheters and things like that, those areas can be huge uh, risk for, for burns from occurring. Then you've got things like tattoo burns. Believe it or not, tattoos, wherever there's been a metal tattoo put onto the skin, that's really where the metal gets nice and hot. And that heated area will end up in a, in a blister type burn, the tattoo ink itself. So you have to also just check your patient's skin, you know, in terms of what tattoos they may have had recently and um, what ink was actually used in those tattoos, if they declare that. A lot of the times the patients don't declare that. This is, the, this is the slight drama we have with MR. We don't always get given the full story of the patient, you know, in terms of sometimes even medical history is a bit wishy-washy. You're missing some pieces of information. They're not telling you, yeah, I had a tattoo, but I don't want my mom to know, so I'm not going to declare that to you. Or I might have some piercings in some places, and I don't want to declare that to you all kinds of drama that can occur. So just kind of, you know, think about what could possibly go wrong, where the risks are, and ask those questions. If you don't ask, you probably won't get that information. Here's a child, Cleveland Clinic Journal. At Cleveland Clinic, we have so many installations at Cleveland Clinic all over the world. Abu Dhabi, recently in London, in the US. They love working with Metrosense because we do, we, we do MR safety to the highest level with them. And, you know, very simple, avoidable accident. Thigh and thigh contact. That blanket should have been pulled in between the thigh, and it wasn't. And this poor child obviously ended up with the burn, horrible blisters on both sides. This is not a very, you know, crude example. I've got some really sad, sad examples where a very small baby that was put under anesthesia to be put into an MR scan, of course, because we know what it's like working with children, you know, pediatrics, you know what it's like. They're shifting all the time and you need to have a, a still clean image. So you put that child under anesthesia the child cannot tell you if something is wrong, right? So you are essentially fully on, you know, it's your responsibility to know exactly what could go wrong. So child's under anesthesia, ECG cable wrapped around the child's wrist, goes through an entire MR scanning process, comes out, and guess what? It's like a horrible, horrible burn that has occurred, developed around that child's wrist and hand, that required amputation. That's how excessive a burn can be with an ECG cable. I mean, obviously it happens rarely, but it only needs to happen once for that to be a pretty catastrophic uh, situation for your facility. In this incident is not so bad. Over here, it's just a smaller ECG cable, as you can see. But over here, it's a little bit more, I think this was actually from uh, electrode, so a little bit more excessive. So just keeping in mind that these burns are very real threats when you're coming in with your patients. Are they fully wrapped up? Have you made sure that they're completely padded? Um, a little bit more will be discussed in a few later slides by Shweta. So a real issue burns. Finally, in the other side of the issues that we just um, gonna highlight very briefly are things like, you know, how do you, how do you make sure you're monitoring critically ill patients? You know, you have all the equipment nearby, what the emergency protocol can look like. Um, <clears throat> when you have a, you know, resuscitation card or something, when you bring that in to a patient that's maybe going through uh, an arrest, keeping in mind the equipment that you're bringing in can be hugely unsafe if you haven't checked that, you know, that it can be put into a gantry of a magnet. Um, claustrophobia, claustrophobia is, a, is, is, is 
a common problem, especially as we're trying to scan more aged patients or obviously children, they're afraid of the dark, they're afraid of that noise. So how do you deal with those very anxious people and making sure that uh, you keep them safe? At the same time, you're giving them the best care in terms of performing the right scans and giving them the images that you need to, to, to essentially you know, take things further. And as I said before, labeling, labeling, labeling. If you're not sure, just check, go on to them. I mean, there's lots of different labeling um, websites out there. I like to use what the FDA puts out there because it's very clear, you know, you've got the green, green being safe, the green little box. You've got the triangle in yellow being MR conditional. So conditional under certain MR, MR conditions, of course. So it's safe under certain MR conditions, a yellow triangle. And then you've got the red circle, which is completely unsafe. So if you have equipment that you are going to be using on a regular basis, then it needs to be close to the MR room. Just label them. Label them and make sure that the staff around understand what that labeling means, what can be brought into and not. Uh, and so I went recently to Jeddah, recently being before COVID. Everything's recent, but it's not. And in the same hospital, it was actually at the, um, uh, it was uh, I met. And in that facility, they had a three Tesla and a 1.5 Tesla right next to each other, literally. It was like literally walk out of the room and you walk maybe less than a couple of meters and then you walk into um, the other suite, which is the 1.5. And their problem was they had an incident where they took a, um, a MR piece of kit. It was a condition, I think it might've either been a monitor or an injector, I can't remember. That was totally okay to use at 1.5 Tesla into a three Tesla. And it was catastrophic because obviously it got pulled in. They had no patient injury and no staff injury, but the equipment was totally down. A quench was required. They spent a lot of money in kind of having to bring it back up that injector monitor system was done. It had to obviously throw it away, bring a new one in. So just not knowing is something safe or something easy to, uh, agreeable to use at 1.5 and three Tesla. So staff are fully informed. What does that mean? What does the conditional labeling mean? So that you can make sure you can prevent damage to your equipment, but also patient injury and staff injury from occurring. We have a lot, a lot, lot, lot. Like I have a plethora. I have <laughs> a database of all the different accidents that are out there. We've obviously got some here which are more closer to uh, to home, shall we say, closer to India um, from the accidents that have occurred. Some few examples. You know, somebody's poor finger got uh, fractured with uh, taking an oxygen cylinder, which you can bear with. I mean, I had my finger, finger, uh, finger, fractured when I was playing netball as a child, so that's okay, but you can fix that. What you can't fix is obviously losing somebody's life or you know some serious permanent injury, like um, became a big news across the world in MR safety when this young chap actually died in, in Mumbai in 2018, because I think he was wheeling in his, either his mother or mother-in-law or grandmother, somebody of a more elderly nature, and an unsafe oxygen cylinder was obviously pulled in and killed him. Um, so there was some damage paid, but not enough really for, for a man's life. Um, and then another, another incident that happened a, a few more years ago uh, was where two gentlemen were actually stuck in for a number of hours. I do remember seeing a picture of them wedged into the magnet. Um, but let me tell you, this is not just India. We so many more incidents that are happening in places like the US and UK and Sweden. Um, so you guys are not alone in seeing what's out there. The ones that I can talk more closer to home is the one that happened um, because of a pacemaker, such a simple avoidable accident. You know, this, this, uh, this woman, although she was elderly, um, she had a, a pacemaker implanted. And even though it was in the reference notes, it just wasn't picked up by the uh, senior consultant. And that caused the, essentially the pacemaker malfunction and that person died. This one to me is mind blowing because it's just, just to think what, um, you know, it's, it's such a, 
it's a rare example, but it happened. And that's why to me, I think it's no longer just theory. And as we've rightly put it, it's not a myth. Here, a woman had a opioid pain pump uh, implanted into her, um, into her body because she needed to have constant uh, pain relief. Uh, and the pain pump inside the body would release small doses of opiate, you know, so that you could you could just regulate your pain. That pain pump, that opioid pump, basically that was put into, when she was put into the gantry, into the magnet, uh, it malfunctioned and the entire contents was basically flushed into her bloodstream. And she went into coma, obviously she died. So it's an extreme case, rare case, but when it does happen, to hell with it. You're like, oh, I really could have done something to, to prevent those type of accidents from occurring, as we said. Um, over here, there's a young, young girl, as you can see, she's 14 years of age. Although the scan itself didn't kill her, what's really interesting for us when we did the study on this um, is that because she had an arrest during the scan, um, they were not able to get to her in time or deal with her appropriately in time during the scan itself. So she was under anesthesia, something went drastically wrong. I think she had some kind of arrest or a seizure. And the, if it was a normal setup, like say, you know, in a, in a operating room, they probably would have been able to get the appropriate equipment and deal with her faster. But because it wasn't the case, she died on the, um, on the MR table. Over here, it's oh, this is tragedy, but nobody died, which is good. This is Sweden. Um, uh, this is a um, one of those mobile MR units becoming quite common in some of the uh, cities around uh, Europe because there's not enough space to deal with more and more MR scanning requirements. So they bring the mobile units in. Um, the nurse, the radiology nurse, he was uh, he was a bit of a fitness freak. So what he used to do is he used to kind of wear uh, weight training vests and your know, ankle weights, and you've got these different kind of weights that people can wear underneath their clothing. They've got different sort of, uh, they've got 10 kg vests and 5 kg vests. They've even got 25 kg vests. So people wear them under their clothing and they use that in terms of everyday training. Just do your mundane tasks and you sort of build some muscle. I used to wear them around my ankles when I used to go running a long time ago, not anymore. But those are just some examples. What he didn't know was that a training vest actually was made of uh, of ferrous. He assumed it was pure sand and nothing else. Like, you, you know, it, it sounds like sand and it kind of feels like sand and you touch it, it's like, oh, it's a sand, but it wasn't. So it was made of ferrous material mixed in with sand probably. And when he went in to change the patient or to prep the patient, he got sucked in. He got sucked in, the patient was wedged in. He actually went unconscious. So he had to uh, get, the patient was okay, but he had to get through some uh, severe um, um, sort of care, intensive care to become better. And he even got sued. He got sued by the hospital. So the nurse got sued for, um, you know, you know, causing potential injury and harm. Um, so duty of care, you know, that's a big thing. So these such strange incidents is that you would never even think about real life incidences you wouldn't think about so now we work with uh, with this hospital through my Sweden partner um, so that they can have a better I guess system in place to avoid these things from happening and that is me so I'm going to stop sharing my my screen just go back to where I came from um, and hopefully um, you've gained a little bit of insight from this because I have to pass it over to, to Shweta now. <laughs> and I don't know if you want me to stay to answer any questions, if there's a protocol in place specifically, or if you have any immediate, you know, points that you want me to address. Or at this point, should I just say thank you very much for allowing me to be here and I'll pass it over back to you guys on main stage. We'll have all the questions after the, with the panel discussion. So that okay. time will be around. So uh, we'll have the question answer session with that. Thank you, madam. That's really good. Thank you for letting me be here on this part. Cheers.